The podcast you're about to listen to may contain random lines from musical theater, terrible attempts at original accents, and a sincere discussion about mental health. You have been warned. Are you ready to start singing with your feet? Formidable! Allez, c'est parti! Non, nous ne sommes pas fous, nous ne sommes pas ivres, nous sommes juste dans la joie. Une joie profonde, nos cœurs elles inondent. Cette joie, elle vient du ciel, non, nous ne sommes pas fous. Welcome to Sing With Your Feet. My name is Lily Fields, and I'm going to be your fairy godmother for what looks like it is shaping up to be an extremely long, extremely dense episode. But next week, I won't be releasing a new episode since, you know, Thanksgiving. But this episode is hopefully going to keep you busy thinking for the next two weeks. Today's topic is one that we've been building up to for quite a while. Today, we are going to talk about how to detach ourselves from a commitment that no longer has its place in our life. I want to thank quite a few listeners for stepping up with their stories. That's Elsie, Tiffany, Helen, Joanne, Alexia. I hope you will find something in this episode to help you through your conundrum. And I hope that all of our Cinderella's will benefit from your vulnerability. First, before I talk about anything else, I want to remind you why we are talking about getting out of a commitment at all. The theme of Sing With Your Feet, the theme of this podcast, is the pursuit of your ideal life. And this begs the question, what is an ideal life? Let me just tell you this, Cinderella. It isn't a perfect, cushy, palatial existence with Prince Charming and an endless fountain of champagne. Although, that could be very nice. The ideal life is the life that you are equipped for. The life in which every aspect of your being is put to work. In which you experience moments of flow in which each part of your life energizes you and in which you are making the world a better place because you are holding nothing back. The ideal life is the life in which you know what you bring to the table and you have the self-esteem to step away from activities that don't fit you and aren't the best use of your time, your talent, and your treasure so that you can invest in activities that do. The ideal life is one in which you love yourself and that becomes a springboard for loving others and behaving in ways and making decisions that are authentically good for everyone. I want you to keep that in mind because our only goal here isn't just to get out of doing something that we don't want to do. Our goal is to become the kind of person who only does the things that fall in line with who we are meant to be and the kind of person that we want to be. It's a subtle difference, but it's important. You are who you are for a reason. Your ideal life is you living out that reason. What we are doing here is by far harder than just backing out of a coffee date because we don't feel like going. We are aiming to become the kind of person who either doesn't make coffee dates that we would want to cancel or who doesn't dread the coffee dates that we make because that coffee date is one that gets us closer to being who we want to be over multiple areas of our ideal life. It was back in episode 29 that we first started talking about commitments. Back then, we talked about why we end up agreeing to things that we don't even want to do and why we sometimes end up dreading commitments that we make. If you don't have 30 minutes or so to go back and listen to episode 29 right now, which I think you should if you haven't already listened to it, the Cliff's Note version is this. When we commit out of a feeling of guilt 
or duty, and not from the place of who we are in our ideal life, we only have guilt or duty to fall back on to keep us motivated. I argued in episode 29 that going forward, it is a good idea to be articulating to ourselves the way that this commitment we're about to make gets us closer to who we are in our ideal life and ideally in multiple areas of our ideal life. This helps keep us motivated as we are out there doing things that aren't always fun or exciting and have multiple areas of our ideal life overlapping can help us keep a relatively good attitude when we inevitably start to get tired. We established that there are three questions that we're wise to ask ourselves when we were making a new commitment. And you won't be surprised to find out that when we want to gracefully bow out of a commitment, we would do well to examine these three questions too. So here they are. Number one, who am I committing to? Number two, who am I committing for? Another way of phrasing this question is, who are the beneficiaries of this commitment? And the third question, why? That second question, the who am I committing for or the beneficiaries question, is one that we need to be very clear about because as we will see later, those beneficiaries of our commitment are the ones that stand to lose out when we pull out of the commitment. So being very thoughtful about who we are committing for means that we are going to be lucid about who is impacted besides ourselves by our decision to leave a commitment. Our concern this week is how to gracefully step away from a commitment. It's a touchy subject. It's uncomfortable, and I know that. I hope that you will come away feeling encouraged to face your discomfort and to find freedom. So part one, navigating the ideal life. In episode 34, which was entitled Navigating the Ideal Life, I gave you three C words that go hand in hand with making progress towards our ideal life. Those three words were contest, consent, and contentment. We said that contesting was the act of complaining and arguing about the circumstances of our life, specifically when it was not within our power to do anything about the problem. I believe that at the time, I mentioned these little lines forming perpendicular to my lips that are making me resemble my grandmother more and more every day. There is nothing, perhaps aside from a little bit of face yoga, or I suppose a facelift, one of those which I am inclined to try and the other I hope I never desire to try, that I can do to stop this evolution. So contesting these little lines on my lips is futile. Consent is the act of receiving, gracefully, the circumstances of our life and maintaining a good attitude about it. It's the decision to accept where we are, who we live with, our job, our car, our status, and to believe that we can become who we need to be to live out our ideal life in these circumstances and that this is where we're starting from. And then we talked about contentment, which is appreciating and enjoying what we have. It's choosing to love our lives in spite of our lives' imperfections. Now remember, in no case am I suggesting suffering through abusive situations or life-threatening situations. What I'm suggesting is that we be lucid about who we are, what we're capable of, the decisions we have made, to forgive ourselves for our past failings, and have hope for our future. But there is a fourth C word that I did not bring up in episode 34 because my goal in that episode was to build enthusiasm about pursuing our ideal lives, about seeking out the fairy dust that is self-reflection and how there is so much joy to be found in making progress. But today I'm going to share with you the fourth C word, a C word which is a joy stealer. And I want to make sure that I am very clear about this with you. This particular C word is the bane of my existence, and it may just be until the day I die. I don't want to disappoint you when I share with you just how much I struggle in my own everyday Cinderella life with, and the word, that C word, is contempt. Contempt is what happens if we get stuck between contesting 
and consenting. Contempt is what causes us to become caustic and sarcastic. And sarcasm is very much a way of covering up contempt. Contempt stems from a sense of feeling underappreciated or unacknowledged. It comes from that inner voice that tells us, like Belle, belted out in Beauty and the Beast, there must be more than this provincial life. And you saw what good that did for her. I mean, she gets imprisoned against her will in a freaky castle by some awful beast. What could be more dreamy? Sorry, did I just use sarcasm? Now, listen, I want us to be very, very clear about this. I believe in you. I believe that you make this world a better place just by being in it. And I want you to live in a constant state of flow and find the ways that what you love and who you are resonate with a need in this world. And I want you to pursue that with every ounce of energy, every bit of talent and every second that you have to give. But we are not all destined to change the world with a capital W. We can change our world with a little w. Our world, as in our families, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, we can bring more love, more truth, more justice, more patience, more care when we love ourselves and believe in ourselves and the good that is in us. We are already being extraordinary. But Bell's proclamation that there must be more than this provincial life, it glosses over most of our reality. We have families, we have jobs, we have engagements, and maybe there isn't more than this provincial life, and complaining about it will not help. If we stop complaining, because we know that complaining isn't helpful, and I would argue that complaining is more than just not helpful, but that complaining is downright addictive. Now, remember, this is my entirely non-scientific theory, so take it for what it's worth. But in sum, my theory goes that it can feel pretty good to complain. And because it feels good, we can start to seek out that little burst of good feeling we get when we complain as a way to make ourselves feel better when things aren't going well. And then it becomes a vicious spiral, turning us into complainers. If I know you, you don't like to be around people who complain, and neither do I. So if we let ourselves complain a little, we risk turning into people that we don't like to be around. And if we don't like being around us, then neither will anyone else. So if we decide to stop voicing our complaints, but never get to the point where we continually, every single day, consent to our circumstances, we will, at some point, end up, as I have on many occasions, you will end up feeling contempt for the people around us. Contempt is equally addictive. Contempt can be subtle. It can be a feeling of dislike towards a certain person, but with time, it can grow to include an entire family or a neighborhood or a profession or a group of people. It can just be a discomfort about one certain person, the origin of which you simply can't put your finger. To be entirely, completely honest with you, my interest in politics has made me incredibly contemptful of great, big swaths of America who do not think the same way that I do. Politics has made me cynical and sarcastic, filling my brain with endless political podcasts and up-to-the-minute breathless reports about the latest legal schadenfreude has not helped either. It seems like the more I think I know, the less I think anyone else knows. This is not helpful, and it makes me miserable. But it's not just politics. Each time I don't deal with an interpersonal conflict, deciding instead to just oh, let something go, let it go, because I am not courageous enough to deal with a problem head on with love, truth, kindness, and gentleness, I am creating a foothold for contempt. If we don't deal with an interpersonal conflict, but just decide to abandon the relationship in order to keep the peace, the peace will come at the price of discomfort. And over time, that discomfort subtly becomes contempt. 
This has happened a thousand times if it has happened once. And over the last few years, I have been trying as hard as I can to trace the origins of the contempt that I feel and then actually deal with it. It has led to some really odd conversations which have dredged up situations that are more than a decade old. Contempt is awful. Contempt can keep us from fully consenting to our circumstances. Contempt allows us to blame others, even some theoretical other, for us being where we are today in circumstances that we don't love and aren't happy with. This contempt can be found in every single area of our ideal life. And part of our self-reflection as we seek to make progress in our ideal life should be to deal with the contempt that is holding us back. Assuming that our contempt is traceable to a specific person who is still alive and a specific situation, it can be dealt with even years after the fact. This can be done, hopefully, with humor, without blaming. It's not particularly comfortable, but the freedom that comes with bringing the situation into the light is really remarkable. In a recent situation, I had to make an appointment to talk with someone who had once, in 2009, said something that I had found incredibly personally offensive. This person and I had rarely ever needed to be in the same circle. But because of a twist of fate, I found that for the next 18 months, I was going to have to be in regular contact with this person. I knew I couldn't let the situation continue as it was. My contempt was so great that I felt something almost akin to disgust whenever I thought of this person. So I did it. I made an appointment. I had to apologize to that person that I was coming out of absolutely nowhere with this. But since we were going to be working together on something now, I felt like I really just needed to clear the air about something that he had said 13 years ago. I explained that I have been doing some work on myself and that I have been trying to get better about being honest and frank with people and that this was part of that work. And then I just came out and said it. I told him what happened and why I found that so offensive. And can I tell you what happened? He apologized because he had never considered that what he had said might be understood the way I took it. He also defended his comments and explained quite clearly how I had misunderstood, but he admitted that I might not have been the only person to have misunderstood his comments that way. And I forgave him. And then something weird in me caused me to ask him to forgive me for holding a grudge against him for 13 years even if he had had no idea that a grudge was being held in his honor. He extended forgiveness, and it all felt really healthy. In the end, I had to laugh because 13 years is a really long time to hold on to a grudge for something that in the end, I now realize I had misunderstood. I'm giving you this example because later in this episode, when it comes time to talk about how you will disengage from a commitment that you want to end, you need to know that there will probably be some discomfort and there might even be some conflict. But facing your fears about conflict and discomfort makes you free in a way that is very healthy. All of this works together to get us closer to the people we are in our ideal life. People who bring more truth, more peace, more justice, and more love into our small W world. And that is a worthy goal. Part two, the seasonality of commitments. About 20 years ago, my indulgent husband and I signed up for a fencing class. Yes, fencing as in Zorro, fencing. I think it was a six lesson class. And we found that (laughs) one of the people in our class. There were about four people in our class. One of them thought he was D'Artagnan. I mean, he kept jabbing at us with his AP. Neither my husband nor I wanted to actually sword fight 
to the death. What we wanted to learn how to do was to hold a sword and to do the gestures and parry and have a healthy outlet for our conflict. But we quit after two lessons. This was an easy commitment to escape. We had little skin in the game. We weren't broken up about not getting to continue. We lost a little money, but we considered that nothing compared to how much we hated the prospect of getting stabbed by a musketeer. I don't even think we told the teacher that we weren't going back. We just never returned. I I like to think that if we had to do it over again today, with the maturity that we've gained over 20 years, that we would do it differently. But so it goes. Today, my intelligent husband and I have two little boys, as you know. Currently, they both have two extracurricular activities. My youngest takes both introduction to dance and introduction to music classes, and the eldest takes both double bass lessons, which incorporates a music theory part, and he's on a children's track and field team. These commitments that my indulgent husband and I made on our children's behalf were done with our children's input, they agreed to the commitment in as much as at six or almost six years old and seven years old, anyone can commit to anything. With these commitments, we signed up for a school year in the hopes that they would enjoy these activities and want to continue them next year. But truly, we only signed up for this one year. Because we are As parents are serious about the investment, both financial and the time that we are all making in these activities, we're careful to make sure that they are, number one, enjoying the commitment, and number two, doing the work they need to do to make progress. This isn't easy, as anyone who has ever taken piano lessons or violin lessons knows. So needless to say, my husband and I are as committed as the scalawags are to making sure that everyone gets the most out of the experience. We all know that not everything comes easily, and I live by the motto, hard work always pays off. So the enjoying the commitment at this part in the game is less important than the actual doing the work that they need to do part. But we're sensitive to their reticences, their points of fatigue, and we try not to wear them out. Okay, so what if one of our boys decided they wanted to quit one of their commitments, like one of them announced to me last night? Ay, ay, ay. At this point in our lives, it's pretty easy. I tell them, we committed for this school year, and I think at their age, they are mature enough to understand that. Yes, I might have to end up bribing him to finish out the year with promises of lollipops or maybe even cold, hard cash to continue his music theory classes. But right now, today, I am doubling down on helping him work hard on what is most troubling to him. Maybe if at the very, very beginning of the year he had had a visceral negative experience, I would have had a second thought and withdrawn him then. But short of something extraordinary, I'd say that we signed up for a school year and that we will keep this commitment. When we make a new commitment, we need to always consider the period of time we're committing for, except for marriage and parenting. I can think of no other commitment that we should enter into without a period of time that we set for ourselves to reconsider our commitment, and I do mean even professionally. And on the professionally side note, this is made pretty easy by the yearly review process. Outside of the expectation that we have a yearly review, I think it is wise for us to set a period of time to consider how things are going in our joy at regular intervals and recommit ourselves every so often. But we'll talk about how to do that when we get to talking about the new year and new year's resolutions. So even if we didn't enter into many of our current commitments with a timeline for reconsidering our commitments in mind, it would be of great benefit to make a list of our commitments one by one and to think about how long we have been doing them and what kind of reconsideration frequency we should allow ourselves. Now, this is going to be where it starts getting sensitive and believe me, I have easily offended in-laws and strong-willed, overbearing friends, too. So know that this can get uncomfortable. There are commitments that we have made to people we are related to or are friends with about which we have grown contemptful through years of silent suffering. Or... (laughs) Come to think of it, maybe not so silent suffering, like maybe our spouse knows. But 
we put on a good facade and no one else might even suspect that we dread this commitment. These commitments might be like, I don't know, doing Thanksgiving at Aunt Betsy's house every year, or Christmas at your in-laws, or going to visit your ailing mother every Sunday afternoon. You probably don't remember how that decision was reached, and it might be that every year that passes, you start hating this arrangement even more. Our dread of this kind of commitment does not have to be permanent. But getting to the point of dealing with it means a lot of soul searching, a lot of courage, and a willingness to sit with our discomfort for a while. If you are, year after year, participating in something out of guilt or out of duty, but you are consistently feeling, thinking, or talking negatively about it, then you have yourself a contempt problem. And there is no way to escape this than by dealing with it. And that is what we're here to do today. So, first things first. On a blank sheet of paper, write the name of the commitment that you are wanting to escape from. I want you to first write what the seasonality of your commitment is. That is, how often it recurs and how long you have committed to do it for. And how you got involved in this. Like, and here I'm taking an example from one of our listeners, so thank you, Elsie, for letting me share this with our other Cinderella's. Elsie leads a small group Sunday school for five-year-olds every week, and she's been doing this for 10 years. She started because her kid wouldn't go to Sunday school unless she was there, so she became a default helper, and now she's stuck. She never committed to a specific time period. It was always assumed that she would just continue. Now, there will be more to Elsie's story in a little bit, but I just want to take it piece by piece. Do you understand the exercise? You're going to write down the seasonality of your commitment, what it is, how long you've been doing it, how long you committed for, and how you got involved. Okay, I will be here when you get back. Elle me fait bondir, et vibrer, crier. Elle me donne envie de chanter, danser. Elle pousse à agir, donner, partager. Et tout simplement de sourire, aimer. All right, I warned you this episode would go long. Usually, I would be wrapping up right about now. But now, we are starting part three people priorities. Commitments are very often about others, and I just caught myself there because I almost said other people, but even that's not true. I mean, when we adopt a pet, we are committing to care for an animal. So it's about doing something for an entity that is not ourselves, unless we are committing to ourselves to do something, which is not the topic of this episode. But it would be a really great topic for a future episode. Note, to self. But let's for today put aside our animal friends and talk about our commitments that involve other people. We make commitments to our spouse, our kids, our family, our family in a larger sense, our friends, our colleagues, our teammates, our neighbors. We make commitments to the kid who mows our lawn or a lawn service company or our hairstylist or our babysitters. Some of these commitments comport relational elements and some don't. Alexia wrote in that example of feeling guilty about changing hairstylists. And let me tell you, when she said that, I felt it in my bones. Wherever there is a relationship, there is bound to be some kind of commitment. Relationships are what make commitments complicated. So let's review something really quick. The golden rule says that we should do for others what we would want done for us, and that we should love others as we love ourselves. So, we have made a commitment to someone, but that commitment has become a burden to us. We need to ask ourselves, if someone I loved felt that a commitment they made to me is a burden, would I want them to continue carrying that burden? It's a genuine question, because it could depend on the burden. But I think that in general, we want people to commit to what they are capable of, in an honest way, 
free from guilt or coercion. We want in our hearts for commitments to be made and to be kept with joy. We talked at length about guilt in the past, but I want to remind you that guilt is a feeling that says, I owe you something. A feeling of constantly owing something to someone, something that you can never pay back, is a sure fire way to develop latent anger and eventually to develop contempt. This is a real question I want to ask you for you to consider freely. Is your commitment one that you entered into because you felt like you could pay someone back by doing it? Listen to me. Guilt is never a reason to do anything. And I'm talking as much to myself here as I'm talking to you right now. But please believe me. In most cases, no matter how much you want it to, no commitment will relieve your sense of guilt or your sense of owing something. What it will do is start stoking a fire of contempt. Eventually, I am going to tell you that you need to confront the person to whom you made a commitment from which you want to escape. But before I tell you that, I want you to do something for yourself. I need you to forgive yourself. Whatever that thing is that you're feeling guilty about, whatever that debt is that you have been working by your commitment to pay back, I need you to write it down on that piece of paper that you've gotten started. This may not apply to all of you, but based on the responses I have received from listeners on this topic, there is a heck of a lot of you that this does apply to. Listen to me. Listen to your fairy godmother. You cannot repay everyone for everything that they have ever done for you, so please stop trying. If you need to, I want you to perform a symbolic gesture. Whatever that feeling of guilt or of owing something to someone else might be, write it down, crumple it up, or let it on fire, tear it into a million pieces, forgive yourself, and then get that guilt out of your sight. Take however long you need to. This is for you. This is to clear your own conscience. Because the next step is a big one. You need to start thinking about the origin of the guilt and how you can confront the feeling of owing something's head on with the person that you feel like you owe it to. I'm going to give you a real life example from my life in a few minutes, but I want to name three possible reactions that you might have had among dozens, I'm sure, to what I just said. Number one, Lily, I can't deal with a person because they are dead. Number two, I can't deal with a person because it's just too scary to me or too hard for me to imagine confronting them. Or number three, but Lily, I have talked to them before. If the first reaction, that is, that it is impossible to deal with the origin of your guilt because the person is dead, well, then I need you to double down on forgiving yourself. Do this. Forgive yourself hard. If the second reaction was yours, then I need you to start meeting with a counselor. You need some professional mental health support to give you the tools to move ahead. There is everything to gain by starting to comb through your problems. It is scary to confront them, but it is not too hard. Start now. Get some professional help. And the last reaction, but Lily, I have talked to them before and nothing has changed. I want you to consider this. There is one thing that has changed since the last time you talked to them. You have forgiven yourself. This may seem like a small thing, but it is a small thing that can make all the difference. You have unhooked yourself from their peg, so it's worth trying again. Do you remember Elsie? She was the one who had been teaching a five-year-old Sunday school for 10 years and she wanted to quit. Well, she told me that she has tried to quit before and that the person in charge of Sunday school seemed to not even comprehend that she wanted to quit and made her feel all shades of guilt. But what about the kids? 
the beneficiaries of our commitments are one of the reasons we got involved in the first place, right? Whether it's building houses for Habitat for Humanity or the Sunday school or seeing the same hairstylist year after year, stopping a commitment means that whatever good thing we were doing, it means, and listen carefully, it means that good thing will not be done by us anymore. I'm going to say something that I hope is not too controversial. It goes like this. By staying in a commitment for too long, we might be getting in the way of the person who can do that good thing even better than we do. Getting ourselves out of the way, especially when we have become lukewarm about a commitment, is often the most compassionate thing we can do for the beneficiaries of our commitment. Staying simply because we feel guilty or because there doesn't seem to be anyone else to do the work means we might just be clogging up the works. Our obstinate refusal to leave a commitment because we don't see a solution could be exactly what is keeping our replacement from stepping up. So stay humble and get yourself out of the way. Part four, accepting the consequences. Hey, Cinderella, what is the worst thing that could happen? I strongly believe in letting ourselves imagine the worst. I mean, letting ourselves for like five minutes get bogged down in the absolute worst possible scenario of what could happen if we confronted a situation. I believe that fear of the unknown is actually worse than the actual unknown itself. Or as Antoine de Saint-Exupéry says, only the unknown frightens men. But once a man is faced to the unknown, that terror becomes the known. So letting ourselves imagine our worst possible situation, that thing is now known and it becomes less scary. When I asked Elsie, what is the worst possible thing that could happen if you quit teaching Sunday school? She said that the worst possible thing that could happen would be that she would be sitting in her church service and all of the parents of the five-year-old would be judging her because they had to entertain their five-year-old during the church service since no one else had stepped up to take over. To which I said, and that parent who's judging you because you're sitting in church too, what if that parent is the very person who has been thinking about getting involved, who has actually been sitting comfortably in their pew every Sunday and had no reason to move to action until now? You see, imagining the worst possible scenario also can help us see that the worst possible scenario is not as scary as it seems, and even it might be a good thing. Discomfort moves us to action. Now, I hear you. When you are taking care of orphans in Uganda, the worst possible scenario can seem pretty dire. But no change can happen unless you are willing to do the next right thing. And if that next right thing is for you to step away from your work in an orphanage in Uganda, then there will be a solution. When you look at the possible consequences of your decision to leave a commitment, then you need to decide, am I willing to accept these consequences? Is my discomfort in this commitment so great that I can believe that there will be a solution to these consequences? Our pride can be a huge problem when it comes to leaving a commitment. If we believe that no one else can do what we do, then we are part of the problem. I will not deny it. There is an element of faith and hope that must enter into play along with a ton of humility. When we are wanting to get out of a commitment we have already made and one that we have been engaged in for a while, there are going to be potentially beneficiaries of our commitment who will suffer. I'm thinking of, for example, like like Elsie mentioned, she was teaching Sunday school to those five-year-olds and she just doesn't feel like this is where she should be anymore. Those very same beneficiaries are the reason we keep doing what we're doing, and they are the ones who stand to suffer if we stop doing what we've been doing. But we need to, in our heart of hearts, be able to accept these consequences, and we must accept that we alone are not responsible for everything that happens. The world does not rest on our shoulders when it is time to move on from a commitment. We must forgive ourselves for the consequences our departure will have on our beneficiaries. Last year, 
I had to pull the ripcord and escape from a family commitment. And let me tell you, the fear of the consequences were so bad that between the time I decided that I needed to do something about the commitment and the time I actually confronted the situation, four years, four years had passed. Four years. Please do not be like me. Get good at working through the worst possible scenarios so that fear does not paralyze you. Part five, a personal example. As you know, my indulgent husband and I moved to France in 2007. So that is 15 years ago as the crow flies. At the time, my sister-in-law had two children, both under the age of five. They lived about an hour away from my mother-in-law and my father-in-law. And my mother-in-law and father-in-law live about six hours away from where we live. My brother-in-law, who was single until 2019, he lived in Paris about six hours from us and six hours from the in-laws. So imagine a triangle. In-laws, brother-in-law, us, six hours on all sides. And my sister-in-law, she lived one hour from my mother-in-law and father-in-law. All right. Because my sister-in-law had small children, Christmas quickly became something that we celebrated in a way to facilitate things for her and her family. At the time, those kids were the center of the family. This made sense. And nothing changed for a very, very long time. And every Christmas, except for the ones that we spent with my family in the U.S., which I believe I can count them on one hand, and it was one, (laughs) was spent at my sister-in-law's house on Christmas Day. This remained true even once my children were born. And this is when the problems began. You see, my eldest, as you might have gathered from previous episodes, he's very, very sensitive and he does not deal well with travel. He doesn't deal well being in places he doesn't know and he does not transition well. That extra hour drive was a killer. There was nowhere to nap at my in my sister-in-law's house and we ended up spending the entirety of Christmas Day entertaining him on an unheated set of stairs. This repeated itself the next year. Only that time, I had another baby. I dreaded this commitment. I dreaded the drive. I dreaded the cold stairs. And I'll be darned, I began to feel so much anger. I felt so much contempt. I felt like we had been forgotten about. I felt so angry because when we had entered into this agreement 15 years ago, the circumstances had been to facilitate a family with small children. And here we were, the ones with the small children, and we were being forced to sit on an unheated set of stairs without any place to go or for my children to take a nap. I couldn't think straight. I was livid and I was rapid with anger. I was, however, terrified of confronting the situation, both with my mother-in-law, who I know is oversensitive about traditions, and my sister-in-law, who I just didn't want to upset by saying that this wasn't working for us anymore. I felt guilty for being resentful about a a Christmas Day meal. I felt guilty for being too self-centered. I felt guilty for making my husband feel bad. I felt guilty for wanting something else for my children. It was around that time that I started thinking about my ideal life and I had started to articulate the kind of person I was in my ideal life. There were all kinds of statements that pertain to this. In my ideal life, I am a person who does what is right for me. In my ideal life, I am a person who doesn't dread the holidays. In my ideal life, I'm a person who speaks her mind. I'm a person who creates special moments for her children. I am a person who stands up for those she loves. Now, COVID came and thankfully, we didn't have to deal with this. In the meantime, my brother-in-law got married and had a baby. So there was another kid involved in this fray. So finally, when it came time to start talking about our Christmas plans for last year, I found the courage to contact my sister-in-law and just lay it out. I said something like this. This isn't working for us, and while I really do appreciate how you have hosted us for all these years, something needs to change. 
because there isn't enough space for the boys to exist and for everyone to enjoy being together at Christmas. I know how much work you put into it and all the organization you've been doing. And since the boys have been around, my indulgent husband and I haven't been able to enjoy it. Can we change the tradition? Was this uncomfortable? Why, yes, yes, it was. But the consequences of it were worth it to me. And there you have it. We changed the tradition. We all met on Christmas Day at my in-law's house. And all the little boys were happy and they had space to play. It was the first time in a long time that I can say I sat down for Christmas lunch and I actually enjoyed it. I have no idea what this year is going to look like, but last year I stood up for my family and for my children and for my sanity and it was relatively good experience all around. One small success brings more courage and this can happen for you too. Part six, facing fears. Leaving a commitment is essentially about facing our fears. We're afraid of conflict. We want to please everyone. One of my favorite internet strangers named Tiffany shared with me about a commitment she had made. She had committed to feed 25 teenagers after a play for two nights. She soon after learned that it was not 25 teenagers, it was more like 55 teenagers. Tiff is, like I am, a people pleaser. It seemed unthinkable to back out. But 55 teenagers, more than double the original number over two nights, it was an impossible task. Tiffany managed to hand off one of the nights to someone else. And today, this is a victory for her. But facing that fear of failing to keep a commitment was no small feat. People pleasers of the world, listen to me. It is so, so important that we really understand the contours of our commitments before we make them that we ask a lot of questions, that we not hold ourselves to impossible standards. By knowing ourselves and knowing what we are capable of, being lucid about what we can really do means that we won't be making commitments that we can't keep or that we dread. But when we have made a commitment we can't keep, for whatever reason, we must accept that we are not a failure. We must forgive ourselves and as quickly as possible, confront the truth. The sooner we make it known that we can't complete our commitment, the sooner another solution can be found. Forgive yourself, people pleaser. Then move on to being part of the solution. Do not drive yourself to contempt, to anger or exhaustion by trying to complete work that was never going to be yours to begin with because you could never have done it. Face that fear of failure. As you work through your thoughts about the worst thing that could happen, you need to identify what your fears are. So write those down on your piece of paper, and then you need to either talk yourself through those fears or to get some mental health support to help you. Part seven, the golden rule. There is one last thing I want to address because as long as I'm going to be going long, I might as well go whole hog, right? You'll surely never believe this, Did you hear the sarcasm in my voice? But I am about to wax on about the golden rule. If you want to be able to free yourself of commitments in a conflict-free, healthy way, then you also need to be the person who doesn't hold a grudge when someone else leaves a commitment. As someone who has committed and uncommitted in dozens of poorly planned, uncomfortable ways in my life, and have seen how people in charge of my various commitments have reacted to my decision to leave, I have come away with an extremely high standard for myself when it comes to being a person with responsibility. Here is my number one rule. If I am in charge of something and someone tells me that they want to uncommit from an activity, I make sure to send them on their way with my blessing. It is my one goal as a leader to make sure that people are never held back by my insecurities and fears. Recognizing that someone who works for you, no matter how precious and irreplaceable that person may seem, recognizing that they are ready to move on, your job is to make sure that they know they are appreciated, that they are thanked, and that they are sent on their way in a conflict-free, joyful way. 
This is equally as true when someone cancels personal plans at the last minute. I make it a point to say, with words in the most sincere and absolutely guileless way I can, the most important thing to me is that you take care of yourself. Seasons change. People evolve. If you are a person in any kind of leadership position, or if you sometimes just have coffee with a friend, you need to set the example for healthy relationships. The golden rule is even at the heart of this topic, just like it is at the heart of everything else we talk about here on the podcast. Loving someone as you love yourself presupposes that you love yourself. And sometimes, loving yourself means that you have to leave a commitment. So as much as it depends on you, make it easy for other people to leave a commitment to. I have said so, so much today, and I barely feel like we've even scratched the surface on everything that we could talk about on this. But I genuinely hope, with all my heart, that there has been something in this episode that can be an encouragement to you, to help you claw back your ideal life from the commitments that are cluttering up your schedule and stealing your talent and treasure, but aren't bringing you an iota of joy or getting you any closer to your ideal life. I hope you know this. I care deeply about you. I want you to be free and healthy and courageous as you head into this holiday season. I really wish it were as easy as waving my magic wand and you would be free of the things that you dread. But if I did that, then you wouldn't get the chance to grow. Do you remember the butterfly example? The butterfly strengthens his wings as he struggles to get out of his cocoon. I believe in you, and I know you can do this. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I am really looking forward to talking about living out the holidays with our ideal life in mind. We're going to start doing that on December 1st. Until then, Keep your fairy dust handy, and I will be available to you via my DMs on Instagram throughout the holidays. A special thank you to Seven Productions here in Mulhouse, France, for the use of the song La Joie as the intro and outro of the show, to Matt Kugler, who sang it, and to Claude Egwe, who wrote it. This is your fairy godmother signing off. Just remember, it is never too late to start singing with your feet.